space docking, Odyssey to unlock relevant compounds. And uh, it's separated into three parts. And the first part, I will talk about chemical spaces in general. Then I will introduce you to the concept of chemical space docking. And then we will take a look into the success stories that were published last year. One of those is with Crystals First, who is uh, represented by Sergei, the second presenter in this session. So before we dig into the combinatorial aspect of uh, our technology, I would like to define what a chemical space is. So if you talk about chemical space, a uh, number pops up quite uh, frequently, and this is 10 to the power of 60. If you uh, take a look at the publication correctly, it's actually 10 to the power of 63, which is surprising, but let's be honest, it's just uh, three orders of magnitude. So but if we take a look at the, those huge numbers, it doesn't matter at all. And um, what this number describes is the entirety, so the total of all possible combinations of atoms, which will result in a molecule. And those drug-like molecules also obey the rule of five. The rule of five is also known as Lipinski's rule of five. So we all know those numbers, molecular weight below 500 Dalton, log p value of five or less, a rotatable bond number count of five or less, H bond donors five and H bond acceptors 10. What's really interesting about this number is that it only features carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur. So all those fancy stuff like bore or even phosphorus is not included in this calculation. So if you take a look into um, compounds that feature phosphate groups, all of those compounds are actually not a member of this or not a part of this 10 to the power of 60 uh, space. Therefore, in ultimate theory, it's even larger. We at Biosovity, we also use the term chemical space. Please take <laughs> Please notice that you use capital letters for this uh, to refer to a combinatorial compound collection, right? So it's an, only a subset of the entire chemical space. The difference between chemical spaces and compound libraries are the numbers. So in ultimate theory, a compound library can be infinite, can have can have an infinite size, but it doesn't happen because it would become too large to enumerate. Um, a compound library normally features up to several million. Uh, there are also newer uh, versions published that uh, go up to several billions, like the Zinc database of 2022 version that features 8 billion, or the Wheel database from Anamine that features 5.5 billion compounds. But this is not something you usually use for virtual screening. You limit yourself to most likely 5 million max, and that's it. But in theory, this is like the size you can handle. A chemical space on the other side, it starts at billions. This is like the usual use case we have in our company. I've mentioned data, and this is like a very, like the driving force behind chemical spaces. A compound library has sizes in the range of gigabyte to terabyte. And if you go higher, obviously you will end up in even larger petabyte sizes like petabyte. Chemical spaces, on the other hand, are usually far less than one gigabyte. So if you take the real space from Anamine, the latest version, if you would download it now, uh, 3.4 to the power of, uh, 3.4 times 10 to the power of 10, which will be 34 billion compounds, um, the size is 450 megabytes. Yeah, so it's far less compared to enumerated spaces. The real database, uh, where's my pointer? There's my pointer. The real database, this is an enumerated version of what Anamin can synthesize. Um, this uh, are 12 chunks, uh, 12 um, zip files, each of 13 gigabyte in a zip format. So you can imagine how big a data about size far less than the real space would be unpacked. Therefore, compound libraries are enumerated. So each entry, each molecule has its own entry inside the database, whereas combinatorial spaces 
do only include building blocks and chemical rules to combine those building blocks and therefore almost feature no compounds except for the building blocks, obviously. The processing time, depending on what method you would prefer, takes hours to weeks. Whereas for chemical spacing, depending on what you would like to do, can take up to seconds to minutes. The results in both cases should be accessible. Um, in many theories, like even if you use zinc, you always end up with some compounds that are no longer purchasable or no longer um, acquirable. Whereas for the chemical space, all compounds per definition are accessible and can be purchased and synthesized. So now I'd like to talk about um, the framework that creates the chemical space. And as I mentioned before, we need building blocks and we need reactions. So building blocks are anything that features something that can be combined with another building block. So in our case, I have now this example of a variety of different scaffolds combined to a functional group. This functional group is presented by a Lego brick in different colors. And in this case, we have an azide as a gray Lego building block, uh, an alkyl group as the red Lego building block. We have a carboxylic acid as an orange building block and an amine as a green building block. So we all have seen the Nobel Prize for last, of last year, the click chemistry. So you can combine this azide with this alkyl group to get this triazole here. And no witchcraft, you can see that you can combine this carboxylic acid with a amine here to get your amide. So if you now translate this stacking of building blocks together to get functionalities connecting the scaffolds, you get compounds. The beauty of this approach is that this is not something that um, is additive, so you get not a sum, N plus M plus L does not equal the, the amount of building blocks, but you multiply them. So you get a combinatoric explosion of possible compounds. So if you would have 10 and 10 and 10 building blocks, you would end up with 1,000 possible compounds. And this is what our um, tool Colibri does. What we do, we provide it with building blocks, and those building blocks contain functional groups or functionalities. We then define chemical reactions, like an amide coupling and whatever you can imagine. Uh, this can also include particular necessities or exclusions. So if there's something like an electron withdrawing group that can affect the reactivity of a functional group, we can also feed it into the reaction definition and therefore also increase the likelihood of synthesis. What Colibri does, it translates the building blocks and the chemistry. It combines what can be combined because you know that the green building block can be, uh, the green is the carboxylic acid and they can be combined with an amine, which is blue. Maybe it can be combined with something else like an alcohol for an ester and stuff like that. And once we apply those rules with our chemistry know-how, we create our beautiful chemical space with billions of compounds where all of our building blocks are combined according to the chemistry we provided. And this is the most crucial part because since we affect the reactions and we define the reactions, we also know that those compounds that are inside this space can also be synthesized. So we applied this technology to several projects and several um, collaborations. And to give you an idea of how big things have become, um, if you go to Campbell and download all the drugs ever published so far, you end up with approximately one, no, I think it was 12,000 12, uh, entries of approved drugs, which is in this vicinity of 10 to the power of five. If you now start to leave this very small space, you end up in um, uh, in um, public domains like uh, the Scooby-Doo uh, database, Chipmunk, PubChem, uh, GDB17, and also our knowledge space. 
So all of those yellow, uh, green, uh, sorry, orange bubbles are accessible to everybody and everybody can work with them. Uh, many companies have provided and created their own services and their own uh, business model where they synthesize compounds and then sell them to the pharmaceutical company, e-molecules to mention a few, Bushi Virtual, MQL Ultimate, also the Zinc database is of commercially available compounds, and those are in blue. And in red, we have proprietary spaces. So some things that company have created for their own investigations, something a normal person would not be able to access uh, easily. And if you now pay close attention, the more you dive into the huge numbers, the more it becomes obvious that you need another approach that is not enumerated to handle those numbers. The largest space so far is from GSK, the GSK XXL, and features 10 to the power of 26 compounds. It's like the, you, it's not, um, the number is just unfathomable. You, can see, you cannot comprehend how big this space is and what the possibilities behind the space are. So the question arises, um, do we need so many different chemical spaces? And well, yes, um, there's a publication um, published in J, uh, JCYM in 2022 that compared uh, the overlap of chemical spaces. So here we have the real space from Anamine, Galashi from Wuxi Aptec, and Chemwire from Ottawa Chemicals, and also the knowledge space, which is public domain from Biosoft IT. And if you now take a look into what the overlap between those fast numbers is. So we have billions and trillions here. And the overlap is so small, just a minuscule percentage of what is available in all of those spaces. So ultimately, you need different providers and different spaces because every provider has its own um, um, building blocks, his own chemistry that he applies to actually create the chemical space. So the take home message from you is here, obviously, if you use those chemical spaces, please consider every single one of them because sometimes you get better solutions in one space and maybe not so good solutions in the other. Now to come to the chemical space docking. Um, the chemical space docking is not a novelist, <laughs> Uh, idea, but uh, the publications are nevertheless. And what we try to achieve at chemical space stocking is to predict active molecules from vast chemical spaces based on their binding mode. So in theory, we want to mine relevant chemistry for a target structure. Therefore, we need a target structure. There is no uh, workaround as of now. So you need something like a PDB file, 3D coordinates, you can use homology models, even Etherfold is valid. Um, then you have to select a chemical space. This is something you can create on your own or use one of those uh, available chemical spaces. And what can be used, but is not completely necessary, are known binders. Now to introduce you to the workflow of the chemical space docking, um, you first have to select the chemical space you want to work with. As of today, we offer quite a selection. Um, we have x plus space by e-molecules, uh, the largest one so far, 100 times larger, well, 200 times larger than the real space. Um, the, I wouldn't say downside, but the other aspect of the e-molecule space is that, um, it's a do-it-yourself space, so you can purchase all the building blocks from air molecules and synthesize the compounds by your own in your lab with very robust chemical reactions. Uh, the workaround is you can actually reach out to air molecules and tell them, hey, I would like to have this compound synthesized, and then they can provide you with some additional services to get your compounds on hand. A very prominent uh, space that is quite that is used quite often is the real space by Anamine. Uh, those guys are pretty amazing. They're doing an amazing job in um, delivering compounds, even in those difficult times for them. Um, the synthesis rate is close to 90%, which is amazing. The purity is almost always above 90%, uh, 95%, and they can deliver within weeks. So 
quite reliable, very recommendable. Um, we also offer Galashi from Wushi and Camwire. Uh, Camwire has some um, expertise in the synthesis of heterocycles as a core fragment. And what Galashi offers are very interesting SP3 rich building blocks from my personal experience. And also to mention, we offer the Freedom Space as an alternative from ChemSpace, which is also a do it yourself space with. 150 million entries. If you are very ambitious, we can also create a custom space for you. So once you have selected the space you want to work with, but again, this is something always something we can recommend you or uh, discuss with you, you get a chemical space featuring Tentelbauer of X molecules. The next step is the docking of the building blocks. Um, the magic behind this one is we do not dock the whole space, but only take the smallest percentage that we require for a follow-up. So we do take the fragments or the building blocks inside the space and place them inside a binding site. We then score them and check them for their interaction quality and other estimated binding affinity. We also do a visual and manual inspection, considering if um, external of the if the growing vector, it's also the people also associated with V with a sentence. If the growing vector, the sentence is facing towards the molecular surface of the protein, we do not consider those building blocks, although the interactions might be interesting, because if there is no space left, it just doesn't make sense to follow up with this building block. Also, we take into consideration doing the um, visual manual filtering if um, interactions are maintained, so you can apply pharmacophore constraints to ensure them. Um, so like in this case, we don't have uh, two hydrogen bond interactions here, only one. Therefore, maybe we would not consider this building block. And again, in this case, everything seems fine. We have enough space to grow. So we consider both of those building blocks as a follow-up. What we do next, um, we check in step three for the compatibility of the building blocks with the um, other building blocks and then let it grow. So basically we enumerate in this step and only in this step, the building blocks for those sub libraries and see what compounds do contain and can be made with our, with, with the best fragments we, we considered. And then again, we do a second check we filter them, dock them, score them, and then select the best candidates for follow-up. So we can again here check if any additional interactions may perform. If something does not contribute to the binding affinity, those buildings block are discarded and so on for every single one of them. And by the end, in step three, we end up with synthetically accessible compounds that we can either synthesize by our own or outsource it to somebody who will synthesize them for us. This is an example of the initial docking. Um, what you can see here is that the compounds are scored by our own scoring algorithm, which is called height, and is reflected by the green spheres. So we consider that all of those contrib atoms contribute favorably to the binding affinity, which is always a good sign. We see some cool motifs here and there. And what the beauty behind this approach is, <clears throat> sorry, let me zip. Um, so the beauty of this approach is actually this bluish dummy atom. So what do we do not do, we do not stock the smallest product possible, but we do dock the fragment as a whole. Basically, this is not affecting the prediction of the binding mode of the smallest fragment, which is not true because there are other approaches similar to ours. That do that can only dock the smallest fragment, which can again in turn uh, result that some of good candidates are lost during the process because this part um, doesn't contribute beneficially to the binding affinity. So again, the bonding motif is there, hydrogen bonds are there, everything is green, we are fine, and this is what we end up with, with the initial uh, docking of the fragments. We see the estimated binding affinity. Because these are pretty small fragments, these are only building blocks, 
we do not expect picomolar or nanomolar affinity, but you can see that we are yeah, in fragment like -ish, um, range. We do get information about the lipophilic ligand efficacy, uh, torsions, inter and intramolecular clashes, and so on and so forth. So this is the information we work with to select the best candidates for follow-up. Um, another crucial aspect that is really important for chemical spacing is to understand why we do this. So here I have three different motives, like a funeral ring and two different heterocycles. And let's assume we would dock them at gain a uh, docking score as an estimated binding affinity. Um, as you can see here, this is like a very reasonable amount for a phenyl ring, depending on the binding site, obviously. Um, those are just raw estimates. <laughs> Please don't pinpoint me on the exact numbers. But you can see that the difference is pretty high. Just to remind you, 20 kilojoule are three orders of magnitude. So basically, 6.4, 6 6.3 kilojoule difference is a tenfold difference in uh, binding affinity. And if we would now follow up in the next step with a worst candidate, as I would say here in this case, we can see that to this estimate of 10.1 kilojoule, we get another 11.7 kilojoule, which ends up in roughly this estimate of binding affinity. Now, if we would have another building block attached to this one, we would end up with an even worse um, binding affinity basically because maybe this one is exposed to the um, solvent and therefore it's not very happy because it's a phenyring, very lipophilic, so not quite happy to be there. And once this happens, uh, obviously this compound is not happy. On the other hand, I would just go down back here, we have a much better candidate. So the much better candidate has the possibility to compensate for this, it gets quite an additional amount of binding affinity through the addition of the building block. And with a given the better initial state, it becomes a better binder in the second round during the chemical space docking. Whereas if it has it gets a different compound attached to it, we see that it ends up with a lower or worse binding affinity compared to this one. Yet, if we have something with a different chemistry, because those both are six member twins, if you now take a look into a five member twin, the direction here is a little bit different, the exit vector, the growing vector, we can see that sometimes it can now become a better candidate, a worse candidate, because now we can see this time the addition contributes only 7.8 kilojoule in this case, whereas in this case it gets 17.1 uh, kilojoule per mole. So what does this whole slide tell you? This whole slide tells you that if you have a bad candidate to begin with, it becomes exceptionally difficult for you to end up with a good candidate for follow-up, right? On the other hand, if you start with somewhat reasonable candidates, you can also end up with bad candidates, but the chances that you get something that works better are much higher. And this is the beauty of our combinatorial approach. Um, what we do, we combine only those building blocks with the highest chance of success. So we do not consider every single compound within those fast chemical spaces, but only take the best compounds and the best fragments of the conservation. So we do not follow up on each route and take every single combination, but just follow up with the best growing vectors for the fragments. And therefore we are able to enumerate efficiently. So given now this example, we would end up with six compounds to enumerate. No, it's only five, sorry, five compounds to enumerate, while the whole rest is not considered and would likely not end up as a good result either way. So obviously the elephant is in the room and the question is, is bigger better? There was a nice um, uh, publication by David Gloriam a few years ago. Um, I added the question mark because <laughs> I just want to be a little bit provocative on this side, um, where he talks about if it does make sense to create all even larger libraries and keep on growing, growing, growing. And um, a few weeks ago, um, there was a beautiful publication that 
kind of like just um, supported uh, the Glorium paper, bigger is per definition better. So this is the publication I'm talking about. Um, Urban from uh, from uh, Zing database, and there's a short chat, which is also a very well known name uh, in, the, in this community, and also uh, Artem Chekasov uh, that comments on this publication and other uh, large li large compound library screenings. And what they um, discovered is bigger is better because um, they increase in number results in more good scoring candidates doing docking. So basically, um, you have an accumulation at the best docking candidates um, due to the fact that once you expand your chemical space, you also end up with rare candidates that perfectly fit into the binding site and complement it. And if you go even bigger, um, those scaffolds start to accumulate in those top ranking docking predictions. What's even more interesting here is that larger libraries are less bio-like biased. What does it mean? So in theory, uh, if we take a look into how compound libraries or compound vendors uh, have created libraries in the past or how FDA approved drugs were created in the past, it becomes evident that it was very focused on um, um, known endogenous ligands, known bio-like structures, like just take beta blockers or um, ACE inhibitors. Um, they are all derived from chemical structures that are known to mankind because this is how chemistry was during those times. Nowadays, people just have compounds, fragments, um, building blocks flying around and try to play around. They want to create new diversity, new chemotypes here and there, and those are accumulating in those large libraries. Therefore, the trend is that in um, larger libraries, we don't have that many bio-like compounds, but by the end of the day, it doesn't matter because those compounds still can accumulate and still be become a considerable candidate in the um, docking studies. What's really interesting is that where event artifacts appear more often, so uh, the paper describes artifacts that as at, as compounds that um, or compounds that display interactions at the target, which are in a loophole, I would say, from the docking algorithm. So those compounds rank pretty high, but only because the scoring algorithm has some flaws in this regard. And obviously, what's the most relevant um, aspect to us is that they increase in chemotypes. So the larger the library, the more chemotypes you will get out of that. So I'm starting to lose my voice, but this is like the perfect opportunity to hand over to um, Sergei, um, who will now present the first success story. Um, so, Sergey. Um, hi everyone. Good evening. Good morning. And um, we'll talk about the uh, work that we have done, uh, and it's called the magnet uh, for the needle in haystack. So, uh, what Alex mentioned is that uh, the idea to get good molecules is critical to get better molecules when we explore chemical spaces. So. Um, my name is Sergey Klink. I'm the founder and CEO of Crystal First. And um, before we start the presentation, um, I need to uh, acknowledge um, Gerd Kleber, where a lot of expertise come from. So we are kind of spin out of, of this group and um, a lot of um, experience also um, kind of is part um, of the work that we have published. Um, briefly, our company started in Marburg, expanded to Hamburg um, at the largest uh, synchrotron in, in Europe where we do structure biology and we have a production facility in, in, uh, in Göttingen only only for protein production and I think I, an exciting fact is that um, Gerd Kleber who wrote um, um, was one of the pioneers and also co-developer of, of uh, the flex algorithm um, so uh, wrote a couple of books and it's called the red bible of drug design and also 
kind of the statistics of roughly 1% of the PDB has deposited, has been deposited by this group. Um, but the PDB is exponentially growing. So it's kind of, uh, it will probably dilute this number, but I think that's, uh, uh, it's amazing. So uh, quickly about our company who doesn't know us, we were kind of next generation structure-based structure discovery service platform and we combine, which is well-placed here in the context, um, rapid access to structural data with large scale computation modeling, like smaller chemical spaces. Uh, for example, we have several technologies to get structural data, uh, refine the data and uh, do fragment evolution. Here are a couple of companies we, we can, um, show that we have worked with them, but we have, of course, many more clients. There's a clear co correlation between structural data and, and number of, of, of drugs that have been um, approved by the FDA. Um, I can only kind of um, indicate that the, there are publications that show that, and I think um, that's important that we get more and more structural data in general. But in terms of, um, how how we think about um, exploring chemical spaces uh, to to get everyone on the same page? We are in the context of, of uh, fragment-based drug discovery, where uh, the idea is to have, of course, uh, smaller compounds uh, uh, like fragments that are copy sub pockets, and we can build uh, them, um, grow them more in a tailored manner. Um, I think 20 years ago, it was quite revolutionary, but with the technologies, for example, with bias of ideas, um, it becomes, feels very natural actually to do that. Uh, generally, the screening cascade in FPDD has biophysical methods that are combined, um, and then the hits, whatever um, signal is used to detect hits, uh, progress into structure biology. So this is kind of this, the basic workflow in, in the industry. There are some problems in general. We've observed and other groups have published it that when two methods, biophysical methods are combined, um, the, the overlap between that might be very low and it's kind of the, the general rule. The question is, what is the hit? Um, what do you put in structure biology and et cetera? I don't think there will be a clear answer that this is the way to screen. There are many, many um, parameters and, and um, um, things to consider uh, for screening. We rather, from the beginning, um, advocated for a crystallographic fragment screen. So um, it's the most sensitive method, what you see on, on X axis. Uh, it can detect uh, low affinity and high affinity binders, of course. Um, you get the 3D data from the beginning and you can start modeling and exploring chemical spaces, for example. Um, and as we have seen that structural data is key, has been key, as still is for, um, for development of drugs. Um, quick, um, a quick yeah, um, recap, how to get co-structures uh, of uh, proteins and ligands. There are two ways, and the, the word co-structure implies that there is only co-crystallization, but it's um, kind of, it's a one, one method, the other method is to apply soaking where you um, crystallize apples, protein, and soak the crystal in, with a ligand solution or something. Uh, you can think about that like a, um, and soaking is scalable because you can um, optimize the crystallization, get a lot of crystals, and kind of um, a screen whole library. Co crystallization is not scalable because any change of the protocol can. May, may not lead to crystallization. Everything else from the process uh, is, is very, um, is the same, collecting data, processing data. Um, and the key is for soaking um, and for FPDD is it's important to have high performance soaking systems. So uh, they're very robust and um, also might be very flexible um, if you change any chemotype or need to change the protocol. I would like to, uh, point out several examples in in the drug discovery community and in, in, in especially medicinal chemistry there's a hesitation to start with a lower affinity binder and there are examples uh, from several companies where a lower affinity binder with a structure in the hand can actually um, provide a fast uh, route to um, designing a high affinity compound in this case from Chimera uh, I think that's exciting it's not just 
uh, having some um, ligand that is designed from a uh, millimolar compound. Um, they actually uh, designed starting from that degraders, um, uh, degrading stat three and IROC four in, in this kind of uh, workflow that is quite, quite okay. So it's um, uh, the resources are quite okay. Of course, Aztecs is one of the one of the leaders and uh, pioneers in FEDD. Uh, they have numerous examples. For example, um, with Ship Two and uh, Earth Two. So Ship Two, the the, the fragment head was uh, millimolar, and um, they developed in a um, low micro. And here the kind of the uh, publication they applied the same methodology let's say to, to co covalent virus not sure why the links are here but um, um, the the uh, fragment was um, actually almost not detectable even though it was covalently um, um, attached um, in in the active site and it was developed to a, um, a millimolar um, inhibitor and um, this publication, uh, I show it on, on a regular basis because um, the Beringer pioneered also um, a lot of, um, of RAS, uh, or development of RAS inhibitors. And um, in this publication, they um, they say very something very similar that what's what's the hypothesis of our company? They call it X-ray first, where crystals first. So this paper was published in 2020. Um, it, Gave us a lot of, um, let's say, content to um, to advocate for this approach to get a lot of structures, and um, here's the same story. So um, the the fragment was millimolar, but using structure-based structure design, um, they develop a nanomolar um, inhibitor, um, and there was there was some follow-up publication that shows uh, show the mechan mechanism of action um, of this compound and has become a a reference also in screenings, so uh, we shouldn't be we shouldn't be um, afraid to use millimolar binders um, in combination with structural data. As I mentioned, the, uh, the role of high performance soaking systems um, is is critical. So we have low low affinity, we, and we have crystals and um, crystal ladders in 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 order to get a let's say not a signal, but the resulted binding event, um, optimally every every binding site with a ligand where it's bound, like every protein in the lattice is saturated with with, with this uh, fragment. And um, because protein crystals are very sensitive, achieving high concentrations for soaking to oversaturate the crystals is not an easy task. So um, with crystals first, we have, um, Proprietary technology that allows us to set up um, quickly um, soaking systems, and our standard soaking concentrations um, 100 millimolar. And um, here's an example uh, of two fragments bound to the same site, where we see that low soaking like concentration lead to in, only in one case uh, to a binding event that is quite quite clear. Uh, the rest is um, in terms of uh, crystallography. Um, it's not a like fully resolved uh, binding event. At high concentration, we see both very clearly defined. So um, high soaking concentration, at least for non-covalent uh, fragments, um, is is critical. And um, we have applied this method, like technology, in in, in different cases. So um, it's independent from the size of a protein. We have worked with small proteins and also very, very large proteins up to more than 4,000 amino acids. Uh, we soak the crystals um, successfully. And um, also this can be applied to, to different stages of, of drug development. Like you can soak, you have to do some analysis of course, but uh, you can soak uh, fragments, lead like compound, and we work also with uh, drug candidates. Also, um, you can apply this method uh, for non-covalent um, uh, fragments, but also for covalents, like as a resulting from aspect. And in such a screening, you can also, um, we've seen like cryptic pockets opening. Um, so it's kind of a nice nice tool to, to, to map the surface and determine many structures 
um, especially um, I would like to share our experience that um, like for non-covalent binance, it's the concentrations of driving of the binding event. It's um, um, not necessarily the, the soaking time, but for covalent binding, uh, what we've seen and we have uh, some project time resolve data, we see that um, soaking time is critical, um, but also um, pH, of course, is, is also critical. Um, now, to to the work that we would like to present here is was a collaboration between um, ChemSpace, NMI, uh, Biosolf IT at the Philips University of Marburg um, and, and Crystals First. Uh, unexpectedly got a lot of attention. Um, even um, Derek Lowe summarized pretty well uh, the work, so it's worth a read. Um, you know, feel free to check out. Um, I would like to share uh, things that are um, kind of the thought process and the kind of the logic behind behind the paper um, um, in, in uh, briefly. So we selected from um, it, about 20 core structures, like four for um, application of fragment evolution using chemical spaces uh, without prior knowledge of uh, the binding of We just had crystallographic fragment heads. Um, and um, we selected uh, them according to what um, the one of the authors, Janis Müller, defined as uh, ligand confidence. So um, from the structure biology perspective, and please modelers always check the electron density when you start modeling. Um, so uh, we checked crystallogra crystallographic ligand confidence, which, which means what is the quality of the electron density? Is the, is the ligand, does it fit optimally into electron density and is um, also, is the binding pocket well well defined? Um, is the ligand disordered? Or, and um, uh, we were looking for high occupancy. So, and, and the, the idea is that if you have a high quality structure, you use this um, binding as a template and it can uh, map uh, fragments from the chemical space on this template and um, apply um, the the algorithm to to screen one of the examples this structure was excluded you see there's this order um, and the b factors for example were quite high compared to uh, the b factors of of the protein uh, this one was very well resolved 1.1 angstrom but um, the ligand even at this resolution was not fully uh, fully resolved uh, and you see a lot of um, movement so high resolution does not mean it's uh, the the binding event is always well resolved so please check uh, the electron densities and the ligand uh, was not in, in in the ATP binding pocket where we wanted um, uh, them to have this one for example that was selected for uh, was next steps uh, was very well resolved and uh, well structured all right, so Alex uh, has already talked about uh, the process. Um, uh, so I think the, the key here is that we started with four core structures and the chemical space was expanded significantly. Um, and the, the fragments, the templates, and also the enumerated compounds were kind of the pulled by this fragment. So you can think that's why magnet for the needle, we want to pull out of the chemical space, only the relevant um, um, chemistry. So once again, we haven't included any affinity data before starting this. It was measured the, the inhibition. It was like the fragments were not really inhibiting, but uh, measured after the synthesis of the follow-up um, compounds. And we use only core structures as starting points for uh, uh, fragment evolution. What I would like to um, emphasize is the typical uh, screening uh, cascade in general, whether it's HES or FBDD, um, it's um, it's like a it's like a funnel, right? We start the idea is to have a lot to 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 narrow down by any, like screening methods, um, get some signals and and work with that. Put in structure biology. Here we kind of reverse the the paradigm. We start with 
only structures and use computational modeling to explore the chemical space and synthesize what is relevant and then test in the assay. It's kind of a reverse um, um, shape, but this shape is actually uh, kind of a rhombic um, where the expansion of the chemical space is in the middle and we narrow down them uh, to most promising ones. Right, um, the overall, I think, um, from uh, what we learned from this exercise is that starting from four, uh, four fragments, we can, uh, within one cycle, get an initial SAR. Um, so the, the rate of like successful synthesis was quite high, so um, kudos to, to enemy um, here also. Um, what we need to pay, pay attention to was kind of the learning afterwards, the solubility for the assay uh, was not optimal for all compounds, so we we could not measure all of them. So if you do this exercise, please check for solubility or some kind of uh, predictions. And um, not all active compounds were crystallized. So we did one iteration cycle, so it's not that we uh, went deeply and in, in, uh, co optimized the co-crystallization. So like, what can we learn from this one step? And um, like we from four fragments, um, we got 30 active compounds. We've seen the early, like early SER, which clusters really work in nine weeks. Um, and I think that's kind of the uh, the the opportunity today that we have um, enamines, uh, real space, or other uh, providers that they have the capabilities to synthesize also the software that we have, and also um, um, high performance uh, crystallography. There are some interesting facts here for the sake of time. I'll experimentally, I will, I will skip it uh, because there's another part. For me as a model, it was Im important to see there's a lot of discussions around fragment flipping, uh, binding mode, and um, uh, we were quite confident that it won't happen here because of the, what I may introduce, the ligand confidence idea, like um, is it well resolved? Um, the binding mode, which indicates um, kind of energetically um, a favored binding. So it's not kind of um, a weak uh, binding event by uh, fragments. And you see in, in blue, it's the fragments and the dark compounds and the same compounds uh, from um, crystallography. So as a model, I always want to see whether the docking was um, kind of, um, cheating but in this case um, everything worked quite nicely so uh, docking results in the pose uh, that we actually wanted to use as a template at uh, this let's say quote unquote magnet uh, uh, was maintained as a binding mode in summary we started with just crystallographic fragment heads no prioritization based on uh, biophysical methods um, the idea of having high ligand confidence. Um, I think there is a, uh, you can define it as a magnet, so it won't flip um, because of the the quality of binding in, in, in structure balls. So if something is binding really well, you will see the electron density um, in, in, in case they also the experimental part is well set up. Um, no prioritization based on affinity. The success rate was quite high. So, um, and the idea is that when you start with experimental determined core structure, the experiment already took care of many parameters that are, are virtually difficult to, to manage, like entropy and, and enthalpy also. So, um, um, and this, this hypothesis uh, paid, at least in this case, paid out pretty well. Uh, and uh, it was uh, quite fast. And the bottom line, we went from nothing, something millimolar, some fragments didn't inhibit the protein even uh, significantly to uh, one of the compound was uh, nanomolar. And the idea to, to, to grow a fragment into something that is um, HTS-like, um, uh, like a HIT-like compound, but we have a lot of structural information um, and everything's happening in one cycle. All right, Alex. I think I'm 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 done here, and I'll uh, you can take over. 
Thank you, Sergei. <clears throat> now back to me for the last story. So you should be able to see my screen again. Um, the second success story I would we wanted to share with you was a collaboration with Genentech. It was one of the first chemical space stockings we did in such a magnitude, I would say. And what we did there, we were looking for WAC1 kinase inhibitors. And um, I will spare you the detail because it was more or less a straightforward uh, approach. Genentech was very experienced with the binding side there. They had their own um, facilities already adjusted to it. So this was a very attractive target to them to check if chemical space stocking can retrieve relevant chemistry for them. And this is a procedure. So basically, they started with Flex X uh, at the binding site of a public PDB, namely 2ETR. And we applied pharmacophore constraints in the hinge binding region, uh, which consisted of methionine 156 and glutamic acid 154. If I'm not, yes, glutamic acid 154. And what they use there is a custom version of the real space by anamine. The beauty behind this one was that it's an only two component reaction, building block A plus building block B, attaching each other, uh, attaching both to each other. And um, then they derived 136,000 fragments from building blocks and docked them with the flex X docking algorithm. 10 poses were generated and scored with height and the top 50K poses were inspected with CSAR. Um, what they considered were H-bond interactions, lipophilic uh, ligand efficacy, not lipophilic, just the ligand efficacy, the c -log p and linker geometry, torsion energy, and chemical diversity there. So by the end of the day, that's how <laughs> it looked like for at least 80 initial fragments. And you can see that this blue growing vectors that we use there are showing where the growing, the synton vector was pointing to. So all were outside the binding site, reaching towards the solvent or the exocellular lumen. And subsequently, um, after the initial round of fragment selection, the chemistry rules were applied. 500 fragments were selected for the enumeration of the libraries. So basically, for all of those 500 fragments, uh, we took into account what can be synthesized with these 500 fragments. And as you can see, surprisingly, we ended up with 5.2 million compounds, which were then docked. Here we were a little bit uh, more efficient. Let's phrase it like this. We use only five poses, ending up in 23 million poses. You will now do the math and see up. Sometimes it did not work out, basically because sometimes only one pose came out or um, there were too many clashes. And after height scoring and filtering, we ended up with uh, close to 10 million total poses for evaluation. Subsequently, we took again a look into the top 550K, filtered them again. Um, there were also other software involved, which I personally welcome very much because you can use uh, other software to subsequently follow up on your results and then refine your results. And then 77 compounds were chosen for purchasing and 69 were delivered. Um, there's another note. Not that that's very important. Uh, and that's what they ended up with. Those are all the active compounds and uh, they came up with four different classes, which is pretty decent from my opinion, to be honest. On the left side, we have the pointer. We have the pyrazole class, which you can see here. The most com most potent compound had an IC50 value, no, sorry, KE value of uh, 38 nanomole. Um, then we had the class of lactams and pyridones in this section. Uh, we had Atza endols, which is also pretty nice hinge binding motive, to be honest, one of my favorites, uh, which is also one very good candidate with 97 nanomolar uh, KI value, KI value. And underneath, we also had some 
potential candidates of the Indazuru class. What's so surprising, even for me, um, 29 compounds were active out of those 69 purchased, which translates into a close to 30% hit rate, which is really, really amazing, even for a virtual screening approach. And finally, compound one and compound 22 were also crystallized, and they retrieved two X-ray crystal structures, 7S25 and 7S26. And if you now take a look into the binding site, you can see the hinge binding motif, the Puratsol binding in this area, and the Atsayandol in this area. We can see some lipophilicity that is obviously required in this section, one here with a phenyl ring, and the cyclo nine is a uh, no, num culture. <laughs> now we have this piperidine with a double bond here, follow up an amide bond, and something lipophilic at the end, also with a phenoxy group for this particular region. If you now take a step back, you will also notice that many of those compounds were also active to some degree, which also provided the whole project with um, a whole SAR study in this field. So basically, chemical space setting does not only provide you with chemotypes, but since you are reliant on fragments and building blocks <clears throat> as your motive for binding, you can also explore a lot of substitutions in this field. So you get a pretty good idea of what can work for the follow-up and what does not. So now the comparison of the docking pose versus the X-ray. Uh, in dark green, we have the X-ray crystal structure. And in light green, let's call it like this, um, we have the predicted binding mode, uh, predicted pose we received from the chemical space docking. Um, what you will notice in this regard, the RMSD value is uh, close to, no, was 0 0.97 angstrom. So pretty good prediction on this side. Um, surprisingly, the Piratso was dragged out a little bit out of this position, uh, likely because the docking predicted or did not see the interaction of this eta here with, uh, the, with the backbone of the phenylalanine in this side. Um, sometimes things happen. There's also some confirmation adaptations of the enzyme because you can see once uh, the ligand bound here, we see a shift from the phenylalanine 87 to the extracellular lumen, it, open up, it opens up a little bit and therefore is able to host this uh, oxygen here, which direct, likely direct this power soul from the hinge binding motive, at least according to my uh, understanding. Uh, the second one, um, a little bit surprising as well, uh, in gray, we see the X-ray crystal structure, and in blue, we see the binding mode prediction, an overall RMSD value of 2.3 angstrom, so not perfectly, but it worked out nevertheless. Um, this was kind of uh, explained by the confirmation I change. We can see it here for the phenyl 87 once again, phenyl alanine 87 once again, and also for the aspartic acid 216. Um, so since our docking algorithm is based on rigid docking, this is something we could not predict, but this is something that would have been able to uh, seen one, maybe if you follow up on the best candidates with an MD simulation uh, before acquiring the compounds. What is of matter though, is the computational requirements of large scale docking. As you can see, um, the more compounds you have, Obviously, the computational time um, increases exponentially. Those are the large-scale docking publications from the past few years. And you can see, even if you reduce the amount of um, time required per molecule, which comes obviously with limitations in regards to the uh, quality of the results, you can see that you require a lot of time to process a huge amount of molecules. Chemical space docking, this is the bluish line underneath, on the other hand, um, scales almost um, non-linearly here. Basically, you do you can screen up to almost infinite sizes of molecules. The only limiting step here is what the fragment size of the compound of the space is, 
of the building blocks you investigate in the first step, and obviously subsequently how big the enumerated libraries of the subsets or sub libraries will be. Another interesting fact, um, as I mentioned, for classical docking, the compute time increases domestically, uh, drastically, whereas for the chemical space docking, it remains somewhat -ish flat. And another big observation uh, was actually made during the revision because there was a question of how chemical space docking performs compared to standard docking. And this is something we did only for the revision store. And what came up here is that the full, the, the docking of random molecules. So we just went into the space, picked up a million of random molecules and a million of enumerated molecules from the sublibraries. And you can see in green that 89%, close to 99% of the compounds from the full docking, from the random docking of molecules had a awful docking score. Basically, the time invested here was just wasted. There were no good compounds underneath. Whereas if you do the same for the chemical space docking for the sub libraries, you can see a normal distribution of results uh, in accordance to the docking score. So basically you get way, way better results in chemical space docking compared to docking of random molecules. Now, um, if I have convinced you <laughs> to perform a chemical space docking with us, uh, I highly recommend to reach out to us so we can discuss if chemical space docking could be a solution for you. This is a service we offer at BioSurfIT, so please go to our website, biosurfit.de or .com slash services, and then you can find chemical space docking, and then you can reach out to us, and then we can take a look if we can help you. So far, Chemical space docking is only a service from BioSurfIT, but we are already looking into the direction of um, evolving it into something more um, uh, full-fledged, as I would say. So, um, since I don't want only to sell a product to you, I also want to give some take-home messages for you as well. Um, basically, I would like to mention that docking of random molecules does waste time. So you should always focus on smaller libraries coming from a different field that is not just an enumerated library. Um, so just use a substructure, substructure search or Tanimoto similarity for your compounds. Obviously, we do have um, possibilities at Biosurf IG to spot you there. Um, you can apply one of our chemical space searching methods, F3, Spacelight, and soon also the SpaceMax algorithm to screen large chemical spaces for related compounds. Um, you can maximize your output by providing input. So apply pharmacophore constraints, use fragments from an X-ray uh, study, or use templates to dock your compounds. Like if you have already a compound there, it can be even lead-like. Use it to as a template-based docking approach to uh, align your subsequent library to it. And obviously, X-ray data is of massive value. So you should always consider if you have the luxury of a fragment structure bind, bound somewhere, please use it to grow from there. And last but not least, just a closing remarks to the two publications I mentioned. For the work one project with Genentech, we screened 1 billion compounds. 69 were obtained and 27 were hits, so a hit rate of 30%, and the most potent one was 38 nanomolar. For the PKA, in collaboration with Crystal's first NMI and ChemSpace, uh, we screened 2.7 billion, uh, a chemical space of 2.7 billion compounds. 93 compounds were obtained. We also retrieved several chemotypes from there, a 20% hit rate, and also with Okayish for our very first iteration round, okayish um, potency. Um, therefore, the take home message for you is that chemical space docking is very efficient to save time and resources, that all the results there are synthetically accessible. So these are not just made up molecules from a wizardy book. Um, extreme fast follow up is possible, which was part of the PKA publication. And this whole thing was done in under four weeks, more or less. 
uh, you can retrieve several different camo types for follow-up so you don't end up in a um, dead end with one class with a one compound class the hit rates are more or less amazing and you can always combine it with fragment-based drug discovery to further enhance the results. <laughs>